Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Gardening is a great way to reach and teach kids the life lessons like responsibility and consequences. Also, you want to make sure you don't get hurt in the garden. Today, we're going to talk about garden safety. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly is a consumer horticulture specialist with Mississippi State University Extension. And Mr. D is here. Thanks for joining us. All right, this is going to be fun, Dr. Kelly. Oh, yeah, yeah. But guess what? School is about to start up again, right? Yep. Pretty soon. Not so long. I understand you have some back to school projects. Yeah, yeah, yep. I do a lot of programs with agents, like 4 H agents, okay. and we do a lot of different things and do, do school programs and uh, work with teachers to have mm -hmm. ideas for things to do. And it's becoming so important that we engage our young people yes. into nature. And I was showing you in this week's Time magazine, there is an article about mm -hmm. how it has now been scientifically proven that the time we spend in nature has therapeutic value. It lowers blood pressure, it it's, uh, makes us feel better, mm -hmm. lowers anxiety and depression levels. So there's a lot of really good, good reason to engage kids in outdoor activities early on. And yeah. to do it through school or at home, you know, either way is great. Mm -hmm. But I have some things here that I want to share with you that okay. I have done in the past with kids. And one of the fun things that we have done is to show children how to press flowers okay. or press leaves or press anything that will go flat between <laughs> <laughs> absorbent pieces of newspaper. That's and great. a lot of people use uh, like big uh, encyclopedias mm -hmm. or big phone books or things like that. To, and here I've got Queen Anne's Lace, and you can see oh, it's pretty nice. flat. Yeah. Now that's been in there a while, and you put it between pieces of newspaper and then put that in like a big book. Or you can do something small like this. This is just a little plant press that I made. You see it's got my name on it, so <laughs> nobody messes with my plant press. And you c connect it with like a rubber band to go around it, and again, it's got... Uh, so I think I do it this way. It's got the pieces of newsprint in between the pages, and I just did this little petunia yesterday. Ooh. And now, uh, typically, you would not be looking at this and messing with it until it got good and dry, and then you can pick it up and then do fun things with it. You can make a, 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 le a collection, like a lot of students have to do right. a flower, mm -hmm. wildflower collection or a leaf collection. So you could do that. That's a school project that's okay. required for some high, high school students, nice. you know, to do that. Or you could do a really nice, and these are my four-leaf clovers. Since I'm uh, Irish, I'm really lucky. That? I can really find four-leaf <laughs> clovers. So I press them, and then I frame them. And this is my goal. Nice. Or you can get more elaborate and do something like this. That is nice. Really artistic, mm -hmm. you know. And, and kids are great at this. And you just attach the, the dried plant material with Elmer's glue. Okay and then, you know, put it in a picture so frame. something easy to do for the Yeah, kids. something like fun that. and like get that. some outside, get some collecting things. And this is a bookmark mm -hmm. that's made. That's the Queen Anne's Lace that I showed you. And this is really fun and easy for kids to do because this is just cardstock. And then you cut it the exact dimension of just old plain clear packing tape. <laughs> And the kids don't have to cut it, you know. They just put this thing on there, zip that over there, and then they get a hole punch and stick them some yarn there or something, you know. So, and here's another one. So, Pretty all neat. kind of fun yeah, stuff. That and neat. that, yeah, uh -huh. yep. So that's the using, the, and you can you can go out with the kids and collect uh, all kind of fun things sure. in the in the fall with kids. We do scavenger hunts. We give them a list. You know, get something mm -hmm. stinky, get something sticky, <laughs> get something fuzzy. <laughs> All kind of good stuff. Yeah, and All I got to show you this because okay. it's got our Mississippi State oh, stuff yeah. on it, right? So this is like a list of some of the scavenger hunt things that we do. 
something that smells good, something that's got a leaf insect or disease okay. damage, something to get the kids out and getting getting fun things to do. So that's good Great. stuff. Yeah, huh. yeah. Now, now tell us what else you have on the table. Well, here. yeah, this is another good yeah, thing let's talk here. About that this one. is yeah. Let's look at this. This is a good. First, I want to show you this. Now, you know, a lot of people have getting used paper and they just throw it away or use to start fires. Well, you can make your own little propagation like seed that. cups. And you just shred up. This is just newspaper. Shred it up and uh, put in a, a bucket or something and get it really good and wet. And then you get your cup about this size right here. You pack all that in there, you know, pack it around. And then just set it up somewhere to dry. And then while it's drying, you can you can poke a hole through the bottom mm -hmm. for drainage, but you don't have to because it's you know it's it's going to lose water from the sides anyway. Okay. So that's a fun project for kids. They get to get wet. They get to get messy, which is good for kids. Yeah, kids like that. Yeah, they, sure do. they do. And then they can, this is something that we have done with the kids too. This is a wildflower seed ball. I like that. And all you do is get wildflower seed, or you could just use zinnia or just any kind of flower seed. Okay. And what you do is you get them out, you just get some old clay from some place <laughs> that's not any good in the garden, you know. So you get your clay soil, and then you get them to put the seed all in a bucket, and they get to get in the mud and get it all like this. And getting dirty. And nasty, get dirty, right? yeah, <laughs> and then yeah, and then they wipe their face. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and then they put them in little balls and set them up and get them hard, and then in the fall, when you sow your wildflowers, mm -hmm. like in October, you okay. know, they just go out, take them home or part of the school garden, throw them out in the edge of the lawn or something where they can, as the winter rains come, and you know, the beat on the soil and spread sure. the seed around, like nature. It's right, kind of like right. you're mimicking nature. Now, some of the kids get really creative, <laughs> you know, and make little faces, like this is a sweet gum ball, and this, this child did, I think that's some kind of sea creature. And yeah. this is an old eaten up a pine cone. Bass. Yeah, that's a large mouth bass. Yeah, see that mouth? Yeah, he's saying, go dog. <laughs> go Mississippi State, there you right? Go. <laughs> that's good stuff, though. Yeah, Kelly. yeah. And then we want to, you want to show these? Yeah, yeah, if we got time? We do, we do. Okay, this is, this is all to encourage, uh, you know how you said responsibility mm -hmm. and leadership skills? Well, this kind of gives them some responsibility. These are little plant head or plant creatures that you can make, and it, they're made from a knee-high hose. Now, you fellas probably don't know what that is. I don't have a clue. But it just goes up to your knee, and it's just a hose. This one's white. This was maybe a nurse. This okay. was a nurse's or something, maybe. Nurse's. I don't know. But anyway, this is, uh, this is just you pack soil, and you put rye seed, huh. like rye grass uh -huh. or uh, creeping red fescue okay. or some small kind of seeded grass right in the, in the bottom or the toe of the stocking. Okay. And then the kids, of course, decorate it. This one, she's got some ear bobs. So we used How about to that? Yeah, ear bobs. Ear bobs, okay, ear not ear bobs. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're too young to know about ear bobs. <laughs> and then they put the little eyes, little googly eyes. And then the child has to take care of their plant. Okay. And you put it, this is the wick that brings the moisture up, you know, and then it'll germinate. And obviously this child did not take care of Hazel here. Oh, she, Hazel. She succumbed, <laughs> succumbed, I guess the way you say it. But anyway, you can do uh, a caterpillar like this. This is, again, it's just the knee-high hose that is uh, segmented. Okay. You know, you'll put the, and then the seed is distributed throughout the soil. Okay. This one, you just put it in the toe because you don't want hair growing on Hazel's face. Okay. <laughs> you know, the grass coming out her face. But on the caterpillar, it's just interspersed. You mix it with the soil first and then just put it in the stocking and, and then tie a knot okay. in the hose. These are just knots in here in the hose. And then, of course, the child has, has decorated the face. And that's just that? cute as it can be, yeah. And then the little tail and then the grass comes up. And I have yeah. seen them uh, trim their, you know, trim, they'll cut their grass. And, and, you know, this one, I had even one child that let it really grow long, uh -huh. and then she platted it. How about that? Yeah, it's pretty cute, yeah. How about that? So, and that teaches them some responsibility and, you know, the, and the needs of a plant. You know, they need light, they need water, you know, those kind of things. All right, well, Dr. Kelly, that's some fun stuff. I need teachers to <laughs> really enjoy that. Hardiness. Hardiness. Always a good Well, one. that's what we are, right? We're pretty, <laughs> we're pretty hardy. Yeah. We're pretty hardy. <laughs> but when you think about plants and you use the term hardiness, what you're referring to typically is cold hardiness. You know, mm -hmm. the, the hardiness of that plant to cold temperatures. 
and our plant zones, our USDA plant zones are based on that cold hardiness, you know, for, for we're in what? What are we here in Memphis? We're zone seven? Yeah, seven. Aren't we seven? So that's what. Some would say 7B. Yeah, yeah. so that means we, could, we yeah. could only grow plants that were hard, supposedly, supposedly, that were only hardy f from zero to 10 degrees. That's as low as they could take that single digits in there is all they would stand. And you know we're always pushing always. the limit on that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, that's what it is. It's, a co it's the, the hardness of the plant to withstand cold temperatures. And as you know, we can grow things down here. They can't grow up north. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, obviously because we have uh, warmer winters. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about another hardiness, you know, there's another uh, zone map that is a heat zone mm -hmm. map. And I know you're familiar with that, Chris, but it's based on basically it's uh, the United States rated on how many days above 86 mm -hmm. degrees does that region have? And I think Jackson, Mississippi has like four months. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Memphis is not too far behind. Yeah. No, okay. and you go up to Seattle and they have maybe two weeks, yeah. you know. So, and it's mainly, uh, the, that kind of hardiness mainly has an impact on our herbaceous plants. Right. You know, that like hostas and things like that really just do wonderfully well in Seattle, Washington and get nearly as big as half this table. And down here, the heat, just they struggle. You know, they really just don't. So that's a heat hardiness. All right, Mr. D, let's talk a little bit about garden safety. So what do you want to start with that? Well, you know, it's hot out there. It is right hot. now. Uh, but first, first, let me say that, you know, gardening is one of America's favorite pastimes. Sure. It's, it's a good physical activity for you to get involved in. Hunting season's closed. It's too hot to fish. <laughs> so so getting out there in the garden this time of the year is a good thing. Uh, you need to spend, it'd be good to spend an hour or two a day <clears throat> out there. Everybody would be healthier. You wouldn't have to go to a sauna. Eat, you know, you say <laughs> yeah, sauna right, right. right. But yeah. But seriously, out there right now, it's important that you protect yourself. And, you know, I work out in the sun every day. Mm -hmm. I wear a long sleeve shirt, mm -hmm. I wear a hat, I wear work gloves, I work in the soil, uh, and it's important to, to protect yourself when you're out there anytime, but especially in the middle of the summer. Uh, you have to make a, uh, a conscious effort, you need to make a conscious effort to drink plenty of fluids mm -hmm. right now if you're out in the sun, uh, and you need to avoid alcohol and avoid sugary drinks right. and things like that. It's really, really hard to beat water, just good old water. Uh, you uh, you need to if if you're uh, using uh, power equipment, it's important to wear safety goggles and hearing protection, and and uh, I'm I'm taking some of this information from the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. They've okay. got a real good fact sheet on garden safety, and I encourage you to take a look at that. But uh, insect control, you know, chiggers and mosquitoes are are very active this time of the year. And we got diseases out there that yeah. mosquitoes carry, so it's important mm -hmm. to use uh, insect repellent if you're if you're going to be out, and uh, that contain DEET. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably one of the best, the, the best insect repellent out there, and uh, be sure that you do that. Uh, uh, always keep in mind put safety first, and in whatever you're doing, <coughs> you know, many times in the garden we're dealing with uh, tools that are sharp. Hose, and I'm not talking about knee high hose, <laughs> different kind of hose, hose and, 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 right. and shovels and, and pruning shears and things like that. Uh, be careful when you're using them, be careful when you sharpen them, yeah. and many of them do need to be sharpened, mm -hmm. and uh, sharpened tools work better than dull ones, but be careful when you're doing all that. Uh, let me see what I've got over here on page two. Uh, Know your uh, going back to the heat. Know the symptoms of, of being overheated. Yeah, that's a good one. If you mm -hmm. if you feel dizzy, mm -hmm. if you feel nauseated, if you have a headache or something like that, stop what you're doing, and you know, go to the shade or go to an air conditioned uh, area and, and cool down a little bit. Uh, that's that's pretty. Oh. If you work in the garden all the time out in the dirt, it's important to keep your tetanus shot up to date because te the tetanus uh, uh, organism lives in the soil. Mm -hmm. And if you cut yourself, uh, you know, you, you can very easily contract that disease. So it's important to keep your tetanus 
vaccinations up to date. Yeah. Let me ask you about. Are leaving anything out? Yeah. Are, are ticks active? <laughs> What's yeah. that? Ticks. Ticks are. Okay. Ticks are at, very active right now, and they also carry some yeah. some pretty bad diseases. The the uh, insect repellent with DEET will help repel those. Uh, you know, ticks, mosquitoes, yeah. are are can be dangerous because of the diseases they carry. Chiggers can just worry the heck yeah. out of you. Now, yeah. if you have blackberries and you know the blackberries are, are are ripe now or they're nearing the end of their production, then I guarantee you, I don't care whether you have tame blackberries or wild blackberries. If you pick them, you're going to get chiggers if you don't use insect repellent. And sometimes you'll get them even if you use them. But uh, yeah, deep some good I, stuff. I think one of the things that I always try to do is just go get a shower real quick and scrub after, real good right, right after, after you've been, you've out, been out, out in the thicket. That's a good idea. But yeah. you know, because yeah. that will. Get some of that yeah. stuff, and then you'll see if you've got ticks and things. You know, you can check it out. Yeah. You can pluck them off. <laughs> yeah, we've actually had a, you know a few agents. Kara Reese been one of them. Uh, had attacked by a tick. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be careful. Out I've there had as well. tick fever as well. Yeah. I sure have. Yeah. And it took a long, long time for them to diagnose it because the symptoms were just so strange. Right. You know, so. Uh, and that's, it's not good. That's, it's, it's not. It's really not. Yeah. It's really okay. not. Yeah. And I got something else to think about too, Mr. D. What about using ladders when folks are trying to prune and things oh, like yeah. that? Yeah. That's why I try to keep my fruit trees <laughs> less <laughs> than eight feet up. My, my, you know, I'm not six feet tall. I'm five ten, and okay. I've got uh, pruning shears that are two feet long. My loppers. Right. And so my fruit trees are just two inches short of eight feet. <laughs> right. Because you know I'm, I'm gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna work them from a ladder, and it's, you just don't need to do that. If there's any way you can stop doing that now, with with uh, apples and peaches, plums, and nectarines, you can do that pretty easily. Pears are pretty hard to to not let get taller yeah. Than, yeah. than than eight feet, but I mean, and you got to be brutal with them. You know, yeah. you gotta you gotta really do some serious pruning in the late winter. Right. Wow. But uh, but. Uh, I uh, just do not recommend working from a ladder. Okay. Yeah, just get a professional yes, if it's above I your head that's is what right. I usually tell people. Uh, yeah, it's not get worth you a the good risk. arborist yes. or somebody who knows how to handle yeah. chainsaws way up that's in right. a tree and that kind of stuff. So it's just too dangerous. Another thing uh, in the garden, be uh, many times we use pesticides, so be yeah. very careful that you follow and read the label directions. That's pesticides. a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Store them in areas where children can't get to them or pets can't get to them. Uh, you know, storing storing those pesticides. Use uh, make sure they stay in the container they came in. It's not a good idea to pour them up into a plain yeah. container because, you know, there's some pesticides out there that look like Kool Aid, and wow. there's mm. that look like Gatorade right. and, and and things like that. You know, mm. pretty green pesticides. There's a, uh, you know, Gramoxone is yeah. a really pretty green color and mm -hmm. it's very toxic. And, and then, you know, Liberty is purple, and, you know, there's just a lot of real pretty colored pesticides out there. So leave them in the container that they came in and and uh, and store them, you know, and keep them away from kids and pets also. Yeah. How do you dispose of those pesticides? Use you know. them for a labeled use. Okay. If you don't, if you don't, if you have extra pesticides left over, talk to some of your gardening friends, find out if they need them. Yeah. And, and, and let them use it for a label purpose. The best way to dispose of a pesticide is to use it for its intended purpose. True. And uh, that is by far the best way I'd rather do that. Other than that, uh, you know, you'll have to go to, you know, landfills mm -hmm. and, and some toxic waste landfills. Right. So uh, use it for the purpose it was intended to be used for. Don't overbuy, you know, pesticides. They last a long time. Mm -hmm. If you store them on the label, it tells you how to store them. You know, try to keep them from freezing, you know, you know, Put them uh, in a, you know a closed case, and, and you can store them, and you can use them for years and years. They 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 last a long time. That's the best way to dispose of them. All right, Mr. D, we appreciate that. Yeah, want folks well. to be safe in the garden, no doubt. Now I'm about to show you what we call bacteria leaf spot. As you can tell from this leaf, look at all of the spots. This is how you can tell this bacteria leaf spot. If you look closely, you can see the yellow halos around the necrotic area, okay? And necrotic just means decaying tissue. But again, it's the yellow halos, which are pr pretty well pronounced. Necrotic centers, bacteria, leaf, spot. Usually see this anytime you have a lot of rainy weather. Uh, the spores are in the air. They land on, of course, this leaf. You have high humidity. Right behind that, you get bacterial leaf spot. To control bacterial leaf spot, of course, you can use a copper-based fungicide or you can use daconil. Please read and follow the label.
All right, this is our Q&A session. Y'all ready? This is gonna be fun. Oh yeah. All right, here's our first viewer email. I have five pepper plants and they are all tall but not producing any peppers. Is this common? And this is from Craig in Middleton, uh, Tennessee. Mr. D, what do you think about that? I may refer to- Oh, you go to that? Oh, I've got, yeah, all right. I know I, what's going on with that. that I do. Right, let's go. Because my peppers are doing the same okay. thing. And I grow my peppers in pots so that I don't have to stoop down. I'm getting old, so I don't like to stoop <laughs> down. So I grow my peppers up. Okay. But temperatures above, daytime yeah, temperatures above goes. 90 degrees will cause blossom drop. Mm -hmm. And that obviously, if you don't have blossoms, you're not gonna have fruit. Right. And nighttime temperatures above 75 degrees will do the same thing. And obviously we've, we've been local. having- we've, we've had that lately. We've had some mm -hmm. those kind of things happen. So don't despair. If that's the problem, they will continue to flower and when temperatures moderate, you know, you will get some fruit set. Fruit. Yeah, and then of course they need six hours, at least six hours of full sun a day. Okay. You know, and then if you, you may have a deficiency of pollinators, you know, because these plants are pollinated by little insects and things. So, you know, you've got to have pollinators around and if you think that might be a problem, you need to have more pollinator plants that attract those, like pretty right. flowering things that will bring in the bees and the other pollinators. Or you may have to help pollinate yourself. Exactly, you Not could do, do that. that. Exactly. Because yeah, you know, temperatures above like 90, 95 makes the pollen less viable. It sure does, Right. it does. So it has to be stimulated within the flower. So you might have to do that yourself. That's true, that's true. Yeah, so that's what I think the problem is, Mr. Craig. So yeah. we appreciate that question. Here's our next viewer email. Mr. D, I like this one. I planted a pecan in a pot in March. It is now 11 inches tall. When is a good time to put a pecan sapling in the ground and how long do they take to mature? And this is Miss Jean in Covington. You're the pecan guy. You yeah. Know and if I were going to the trouble to plant a pecan tree, okay, <laughs> you wouldn't do it from a seed. <laughs> I would not do it from a seed because <laughs> even if you know what yeah. mm -hmm. tree that came from, that pecans are cross pollinated. Uh -huh. And so it's only half, that the mother tree is only half of what that pecan is. It might be from a little bitty small seedling tree right. somewhere else, but if they're wind pollinated, they are cross pollinated. And uh, you know, to answer your question, uh, I would plant it in the fall, oh, winter, yeah. late, late winter. But, but if I really wanted a good pecan tree, I would go to a pecan nursery or, or a get lawn a and garden center one. and get a variety that yeah. you want. And, and by the way, one pecan tree, unless you have others around, yeah, you wow. must have another one yeah, around yeah. unless you bought this pecan and brought it in. But remember, I said it's cross-pollinated. Yeah. And so we don't even know whether this one is a type one or a type two pecan, so you wouldn't know what kind of pollinator to get. You need, you need two pecan trees, and one needs to be a type one, one needs to be a type two, uh, and, and, and the only way you can figure that out is if you buy them that have a label hanging off yes. of them. How long does it take them to produce? If you get some of the newer precocious varieties, you can probably be eating pecans in six, seven years, uh -huh. you know, five, six, seven years. If this is off of a, uh, an old Elliot or which Stewart, Stewart or something yeah. like right. that, uh, it can take 15, yeah, 15 wow. from years, a seedling, you know, yeah, and then you don't know what you're getting. So it right. takes a long time, so I would I would look at it that way. I would uh, if you want to get pecans pretty quick going and buy you a couple, three or four that uh, and and get a, at least one type one and 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 you know maybe a couple <coughs> of type ones and a couple of type twos and. All right, so there you have it, Miss Jean. Hope that helps you out. Uh, here's our next viewer email. Can you please explain to us gardeners about these awful tomato hornworms? <laughs> How and when do they come to be on our tomato plants? Do hornworms come out of the soil or are they from eggs laid by a large moth? And this is Miss Hazel and Eads. It's actually a good question though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. do they come out of the soil or from eggs that are laid by right. large moths? Yes. Yes. They do come they do. from the moths. The hawk moth or it's and, called and, a sphinx moth puked. or hummingbird moth. And they pupate in the soil. So uh, it's the uh, sphinx moth. Yeah. They're sometimes Swamp. called hummingbird moth. Yeah. It's a sphinx moth. It's a, it's a real pretty moth. 
the moth will lay, the egg, lay an egg on a tomato plant mm -hmm. and it'll hatch and it'll be a little bitty hornworm and it mm -hmm. gets bigger as the more it eats. The, and you can, you, you can find them by looking for the droppings. Right. Right. Is the easiest way to find them because they're so well camouflaged yeah. on a tomato plant. It, yeah. you know, look you, for the bare stems. That's bare stems. That's, yeah. where, they've they yeah. that's yeah. where they've been. You yeah. know, that's where they've been. They yeah. will but, uh, just about to foliate uh, a tomato plant. Sure will. Fortunately, uh, a real good product to control them is BT. Bacillus yes. thuringiensis does a real good job of controlling them. There's no waiting period. It's not harmful to humans. It's not harmful to beneficial insects. And uh, you can put that out there, and they'll take care of them. But uh, they are. From a and after they finish, like this old boy right here yeah. uh, that we got on the table, right. he's about done. You know, he's about as big as he's going to get. So he'll he'll crawl off in the ground, fall down in the ground, and and and, and he'll pupate. Okay. And and then next spring. It'll be next spring. Uh, this when uh, and I don't know whether they go yeah, tomorrow, yeah. Come, come out as a moth. And, okay. And, and here again are the dropping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind little worms have little droppings, like droppings. droppings, big worms have big droppings. Yes, it's a big dropping, <laughs> no doubt about that. And that one is, by the way, a tobacco hornworm. The tomato hornworms have a V on them. I mean, okay. You can tell the yeah. difference. They, the V is, a, wow, I could have had a V8. Just remember that for <laughs> tomatoes. That one has just slashes on yeah. the side, so that's a tobacco Someone hornworm. It. Mm. it doesn't have the V. Okay. got the slashes. All right, Miss Hazel. There you have it, Mr. D. All right, Mr. D, Dr. Kelly, thank you. We're out of time. Yeah, come on. Been fun. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To get more information on any topics we talked about on today's show, go to familyplotgarden.com. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.